Good morning, Bethel. Um, welcome to our online service. Uh, we hope that you are uh, just safe and doing well wherever you are and tuning in from. Uh, just at this time, uh, before we just worship together and before we enter into the Lord's presence, why don't we just take a minute to, uh, just from where we are, uh, just take a minute to pray and just ready our hearts today. And just especially with all that's going on, let's just pray, God, we want to... Lord, not fix our eyes on all the distractions, but Lord, to fix our eyes on you this morning and uh, throughout this time, Lord, that we would look to you, uh, continue to trust in you, uh, to know that you are good and you are working in the midst of everything, and that we'd commit this time and this worship unto you, Lord, and uh, give you the worship and glory that you're deserving of. So why don't we just take a minute, church, to do so, uh, and then we'll sing a few songs of worship together. Let's pray. Yeah. 
that we truly want to hold on to today. That, Father, in any circumstance, though confusion and uh, the troubles, Lord, may, Father, just take our eyes off of you. We want to hold just firmly and just grasp onto the fact and truth that you are still sovereign, that in every circumstance and every season that you are still holy, and that, God, you are working still powerfully through this time. That, Lord, your love for us is so just perfect and there's nothing that would separate us from you. And so, God, as we hold on to these truths, 
today. Father, may we just hear from you, again, to be reminded of who you are, of all that you are doing still, and uh, that at the end of the day, Father, we have our salvation uh, firmly set on the fact that your son, Jesus, died for us, and there's nothing that can take that away. And so, God, I pray that as we acknowledge these truths today, that our worship would rise to you and that you would receive it in gladness and that you would delight in the fact that your church is gathered here today to worship you. And so, God, speak through uh, your messenger today, uh, through Pastor Justin, and that we would be open, uh, just have open hearts and ears to receive your word today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, hey, guys. How are you? Thank you for joining us online for our service today. My name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. Just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. Just wanted to start off by saying is that we are here for you. All of the pastors, all of the Life Stage pastors are here. Please be free to contact us at any time. We're here just to talk or just to pray. Just want to remind everyone uh, you are not alone during this time. Just want to encourage you with a few announcements is this week we are starting our virtual house church. I'm really excited about this. Your shepherds will be contacting you, so please have a great time of community and continue to pray for each other. If you're not part of a house church, please go online and we will connect you with a shepherd. Also, I want to encourage you is that we are doing our food drive. Uh, more than ever during this time, many of the food banks are short with food, so please, we partnered with South County Outreach and we are accepting canned foods. You could drop them off at any time in front of our Sea Sanctuary. There's a bin, just drop it off and we'll donate it to South County Outreach. Also, I wanna encourage everyone that right after this service, we do have family worship. We do have children's services available for all children. So please go to our website, click on um, the appropriate age group for your child and enjoy a great time of worship uh, with your children. And lastly, um, I want to continue and encourage everyone during this time to continue with your tithes and offerings. There's two ways that you could do it. Both of them start online. You can either give online through our website or you can actually mail your physical check to church. So please uh, be free to go online, check that out. If you have any questions, please be free to contact me or give me a call. At this time, we'll have the reading of God's word. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 19. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everyone, everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you have given me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and that I believe that you have sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they, have, they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, that these things that I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Let us pray. Father God, we're just so grateful that, that we have the privilege of, even now, during these times, that we're able to come together, even online, to read your word and to hear a message given to us, God. I just pray that, that you really just be with Pastor Justin even now as he speaks to us. And I pray that, that even as he speaks, Lord Father God, that your spirit will be upon him, 
I pray that every word that comes out of his mouth will be ordained by you, Lord. And I pray that you really just be with us as well as we listen to his word. I just pray that our hearts will be open to uh, what you have to say, that our ears will be open, Lord. And I pray that, that whatever is um, spoken to us, Lord Father God, that we'll be able to really just hear your voice above everything else, Lord. Remind us of your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Your, thank you for your son, uh, your love, your mercy to us. In your name I pray, amen. Hi, Bethel family. Uh, excited that uh, you could join us online to worship in this unique uh, season that we're in. And uh, we're looking at John 17. And I uh, just want you to know that here in this context, just by way of background, Jesus is uh, lifting up a prayer for us. He's praying for us. And the passage that, that passage that Sam just read for us is a part of his prayer. And in his prayer, Jesus is some, saying something that, that's really pretty cool. In verse 19, he says, For their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Now, those are pretty amazing words, and let me tell you why. Because what he's saying is that to be a Christian is to be sanctified. To be a Christian is to be consecrated. In other words, to be a Christian is to be holy. It's to be holy. You have to know what it means to be holy. And so in his last meeting with the disciples, Jesus, before he dies, says, I have made myself holy. I have sanctified myself so that, why? That they, or you and I, might be holy so that they might be sanctified. And so hear this. Jesus has completely dedicated and committed himself. He has lived his life and even died for one priority, And that priority is that you and I would be made holy. His desire and his goal is to make us holy. Do you see that? Look at it again in verse 19. For their sake I consecrate, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So Jesus is saying, I have completely set myself apart to make you holy. That's what I live for. That's what I'm going to die for. And that's the last thing on my lips, that as I'm about to die, I came to make you holy because this is the essence of what Jesus came to do. This is at the heart of his mission for us. So there's two things that I want you to consider. The first thing is this. I want you to consider what is the definition of holiness? What is a biblical understanding of holiness? In other words, what is holy? What does it mean to be holy? What is holiness? And I want to propose to you that the passage here it tells us that holiness is at least three things, three things. It means, number one, completely committed to God. Secondly, it means completely focused on God. And thirdly, completely renovated by God. And so totally, utterly, completely, absolutely, in its entirety, that you are committed to God, that you are focused on God, and that you are renovated by God. Completely. Now, I want to talk about each one of those things briefly. Number one is this. It means to be completely, uh, to understand holiness, that you have to, it means that you have to be completely committed to God. Now, look at verse 19. It says, for their sake, again, this is a familiar verse, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. For them, I consecrate, sanctify myself. And here you have the essence of the word consecrate or sanctify and the word the essence of the word is holy and what that means is it means to separate it means to separate to be a holy person to be a holy people it means to separate distinct to isolate to be unconnected now (laughs) it sounds kind of funny it's ironic that we're saying that because we've got this uh, you know situation with the coronavirus and we are to separate from one another keep a six feet distance from one another. We are to isolate, to quarantine ourselves in our homes, right? Well, in a funny way, that's what it means to be holy. It means to separate. And so it's a very clear, it's very clear that when Jesus says that I consecrated myself, that I sanctified myself here in verse 19, it doesn't mean that I'm becoming a better person. He doesn't mean that I'm becoming a more pure person. The Bible everywhere says that he was already perfect that he was already 
perfect. In fact, he himself says at one point to his accusers, who charges me with sin? And what Jesus is saying is that he's already perfect and sinless. So how in the world could he become sanctified? Think about that. He, there's no way he can be more sanctified. He's already perfect and pure. And so how could he say, you know, uh, I'm going to be more sanctified? He doesn't say that. The answer to that is that is there's an essential etymology of the word. It doesn't mean to be a better person or it doesn't mean to be a nicer person. In essence, it means to be set apart, to be separate, to be completely committed to something so that, that others, all others concerned are ditched. It's about focusing on the primary and ditching, separating yourself from all the peripheral secondary issues. So that's what it means. So let me give you an example. Um, here's an athlete, and, in, and she wants to win the Olympic gold medal, right? What does she do? She, she sanctifies herself. She sets herself apart. Now, what that means is that she separates herself from a lot of, I would imagine, a lot of certain types of food, okay? If she sees donuts and um, fried food and sugary candy, I, I cannot separate myself from those things because uh, I'm too tempted. But she, as an athlete, because she wants to win the gold medal, she will sanctify herself. She will separate herself from a lot of foods. She separates herself from a lot of activities. She will separate herself from a lot of attitudes. Now, none of these foods, none of these activities, none of these attitudes would she say to other people are necessarily wrong. You wouldn't say any of the, them are wrong in themselves, but they're wrong for her. Why? Because what they would do is they would, they would prevent her. They would block the cause. So she sanctifies herself, and now you're getting the idea. She has set herself apart. Why? Because she is a holy athlete. Because she has sanctified herself for this cause, this goal to win the gold medal. Now, what does it mean to be a holy person? Uh, what has Jesus done? Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't mean that he has become perfect. Remember, he was already perfect. What it means is that he has taken all of his resources, he has taken all of that in all time, He's taken everything he has, everything he is, and he says, no longer am I using it for any other purpose except for this. And what this means is that he, is, he has committed himself. He has devoted and dedicated himself. He has ditched competing concerns. He has let go and separated himself from competing priorities. And so this is the essence, this is the essential definition of holiness. Now think about this. You go back to Numbers chapter 14, where the people of God, Israel, were brought to the brink of the promised land. And there in uh, Numbers 14, God says to them, go in there. That's the promised land that I promised you. Cross over the Jordan River, and you go and take that land. It's yours for the taking. Go, right? But what do the people say? They say, impractical, impossible. There are giants over there, and we're going to be enslaved, and we're going to be slaughtered if you go there. So God looks at his people and said, all right, if you won't obey me, I'm going to send you back into the wilderness where you're going to wander around for 40 years, and you're all going to die there, and I'm going to give the land to the next generation, to your children. Then he says, except for Caleb and Joshua. God looks at Caleb who was one of the spies who went into the promised land, and he came back and he said, unlike the others who replied that we can't go there, they're giants there, we're scared, Caleb was one who said, let's go take it. God is with us. God is for us. We can do this. Let's take it. And God looks at Caleb, and here is a great definition of holiness. God says, but my servant Caleb, there is a different spirit in him, for he has followed me completely. He has followed me absolutely. Therefore, I will bring him back into this promised land, and I will give it to him and to his generations after him. Now, what is God saying? Do you see how relevant this is? God looks at you today and me. He looks at us and says, let's go into the land. And he gives you the rules. He tells you how to do things. He tells you the things that you have to do. And there are lots of them to do here. There's, we need to obey God. 
you know, and it says, pour yourself out for other people. Give your time and money away. Always tell the truth. Never repay evil for evil. Forgive everybody. Keep yourself sexually pure. And so, but when you hear God say all of those things, what do you say? What's your natural attitude? What do you, how do you respond? You say, impossible, impractical. We'll be slaughtered out there. We'll be enslaved out there. And I think that's what most people say. Or do you have a different spirit, the spirit of Caleb and Joshua? Are you someone who realizes, man, if I'm going to take the land, if I'm going to listen to what God says, I'm going to have to sanctify myself. I'm going to have to uh, be holy. I'm going to have to sanctify and consecrate myself if I'm going to get uh, the gold. I'm going to have to set myself apart. So to be holy means to be absolutely, completely committed to God. It's a priority thing. Now, secondly, it also means to be completely focused on God. Completely focused on God. There's another place in the Bible that talks about this very same thing that is mentioned here in John 17, verse 19. In verse 19 here, Jesus says, I consecrate myself for their sakes. I set myself apart for this work. Now, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says that Jesus, he set his face like a flint to go up to Jerusalem and die. It says there that uh, in, in Luke 9, 30, uh, 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, right? So he set his face to Jerusalem. He looked at something, okay? He, he wouldn't have taken his eyes off of it. He, he would look at nothing else. His eyes were focused on the cross uh, because of the goal to save us. And that's the same thing it's saying here in Luke 9, 51, as he's saying here in John 17. It's another way of putting it, as another way of helping us understand what holiness means. He looks at one thing, one thing only. So I don't play golf at all. There's a reason why um, people won't play golf with me. Pastor Dan won't play golf with me because he knows how bad I am. Now, one of the things that I think drives people crazy I actually took some golfing lessons in Seattle, and the, the coach who was giving me these lessons was frustrated because what I would do is as, as I was about to uh, bring my club and I would swing all the way through, I would look up from the tee to see where the ball was going. It was just a natural habit because I wanted to see where the ball was going. I expected the ball to go straight and far, but it went all over different places. And then when I, was on the, uh, when I was playing golf, I would always look up as soon as I hit the ball off the tee because I had to find my stinking ball. I couldn't find my ball. And the coach would say, never look up. I will keep my eye on the ball. It's like my daughter uh, plays softball, and she's becoming a better hitter. But her batting coach says, you got to keep your eye on the ball and keep your head down. Focus on the ball. Focus on the ball and keep your head down. Don't look up. Don't look at anything else. And so, but she keeps doing that and is driving her coach, her batting coach, crazy. You see, the Bible says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, up in verses 11 and 12, it's pretty, it pretty much says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, right? Holiness comes from fixing your face on the name of God and on the, on the truth of God. So it means to look at, focus gaze at it and to nothing else. It means to be controlled by who he is. So you see, that's holiness. Holiness would mean, for example, taking any of the names of God and you fix your mind, your gaze upon that name. So and you look at nothing else. You look nowhere else. Whatever you're looking at, you turn away from that and you look at the name of who God is. So let's take the name Father. Father, for example. What if you fix your face just for a moment on the name Father, that He is our Heavenly Father. He is a good, good Father. I think there are a couple of takeaways from that right away when you think about the fruits of holiness, that these are uh, Christ-like characteristics that will grow in your life of holiness. So one of the things that can come about as you focus on the name Father, one is that you'll develop a praising spirit instead of an irritable spirit. A praising spirit instead of an irritable spirit. In families, you put up with things that you don't put up uh, with anywhere else. There's nothing less irritable than the family of love, uh, family love of God. And so look at Jesus on the cross. Look at them mocking him 
uh, as his life is ebbing away. Look at them saying, if you're king, come on down. What does Jesus do? He looks up to the Father and says, Father, forgive them. They're not completely aware of what they're doing. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. There is, if you think about this, no one less irritable than the Father love of God. I mean, look at that. Look at the way he responds. You call that irritability? No. He's not irritable at all. He says, Father, they mean well. Father, they don't completely get it. Forgive them. Forgive them. Yes, I know they're crucifying me. I know that they're killing me, but they don't completely understand what what, what, what's going on. Now, you think about what's going on at the cross and Jesus calling out to his Father. You talk about a lack of irritability. I mean, he's not irritable at all. You fix your face on that. In Luke 15, when, where the father uh, has, that, um, has a prodigal son coming back, the f- prodigal son comes back, and what does the son say roughly? Father, I squandered, squandered uh, the wealth that you gave me on worthless, wasteful living, right? And what does the father say? He says, all that matters is that you're back, right? And he kisses him, and he pounces on, me, on him. There's not even an ounce of, ir- he's not irritable at all, right? So you see, when you, Christian friends, look at somebody's faults, and you look at somebody's sins, and you let that irritate you, and you hold it against them, what you're doing at that moment is you're fixing, fixing your face not on the Father, right? And so as a matter of fact, there is a sense in which you are out of touch with reality because the Father covers offenses. The Father covers those things. The Father isn't irritable. Frankly, when you hold things against people, and I do that all the time. I do that to my wife. I do that to my kids, and I get irritable, easily irritable. But I'm, re- I'm learning this, that when you hold things against people, you are actually saying, my God in heaven holds things against me. You're acting like the man in the parable in Matthew 25, 24, who turns to the master and says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. A lot of you are treating God that way. The moment you're irritable, because if you'd fix, if you would just gaze and you fix your face on the Father saying, all that matters is that you're back. All that matters is that you're here, you came back. If you'd fix your face on that on your great Savior on the cross, saying, Father, they don't quite understand what they're doing. You would say, how in the world can I hold this against these people? How in the world can I do that? How can I be irritable uh, towards these people? Listen, the test of whether or not you're holy or whether or not you're fixing your face on the name of the Father is whether those people who are most flawed, people who are most uh, irritable, who therefore must get a lot of criticism from all over the place from people, whether they consider you, consider you a safe harbor. They feel safe around you. They feel that, they, 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 that you accept them. There are a lot of people out there with so many flaws, so many uh, imperfections, blemishes, that they're getting criticism everywhere, and they irritate everybody. They irritate you and me, right? Do they consider you a safe harbor? Do they consider you more understanding and more patient than other people? Are they willing to come and tell you their problems because they sense a lack of irritability, a praising spirit instead of an irritable, irritable spirit? Is that in you? Is that, can that be said of you? Because if it's not, you have not fixed your face on the name of the Father. You are not being sanctified by the truth. You are not holy. Here's another example. If you fix your face on the name of the Father, not only does it give you a praising spirit instead of an irritable spirit, but I'll give it another way. It gives you a repenting spirit rather than a defensive spirit. A repenting spirit rather than a defensive spirit. Let me explain. If you have a billion dollars in the bank and somebody picks your pocket of $100, it's like a prick. Uh, It's like a prick of the finger. But if you only have $200... Uh, to your name, and somebody picks your pocket of $100, it's like a knife to the heart, right? Same amount, same crime. For one, it's a prick in the finger, but for the other, it's a knife in the heart. Now, here are two people, very often two Christians, and I see them in conflicts. I see them in situations where maybe they're being criticized, 
and I see them in, in, a, in, in, in a stressful situation. I see them in situations where they're, they've blown it, they've dropped the ball, and somebody is telling them about it. And it's so clear that there are some people who are so quick and able to repent. They say, you know, you're right. I blew it. I am so very sorry. You can tell it's more than a prick of the finger because there are, they are rich with the Father's love. I see other people, though, who are angry, who shift the blame, they hate themselves, and they're really defensive. It's clear that it's not a prick of the finger. It's a knife in the heart. Why? They haven't fixed their face on the name of the Father. Do you see that? You see a repenting spirit rather than a defensive spirit. Now, a person who is becoming holy through fixing your face on the Father is humility without flattery. Humility without, uh, without uh, groveling. Why? Because the humility that comes from holiness is not the humility that comes from uh, low self-esteem. That's the groveling. It's the humility that comes from the richness of the Father's love. Just one more example. Fixing your face on the name of the Father gives you a praising spirit full of compliments rather than an irritable spirit. It gives you a repenting spirit rather than a defensive spirit, but it also gives you, here's the third thing, a grateful, a thankful spirit rather than a self-pitying spirit. You get up every day, instead of looking at what's wrong, you look and say, why, God, have you been so good to me? You wake up thinking like that. And there's a confidence if you fix your face on the Father. Listen, if any of you who are maybe Sunday school teachers, right, and you've ever had to have a a, a preacher's or pastor's kid as as one of your students, right, you know that that is a hard situation. You don't like that. Why? Because many times the preacher's children at that Sunday school teacher will say, you can't discipline me. You can't tell me what to do. Okay, you know, I'm in charge here. Why? Because my dad is the pastor of the church. And I hope my daughter Tabitha, my boys Barnabas and Maximus are not like that. I hope they are a, a blessing to their teachers. But, you know, like I've, I've heard that where, you know, a, a kid whose father is the preacher or the pastor of the church, they will say, you know, you can't, do, you can't tell me what to do. My dad is in charge. My dad is the pastor, right? And so, and of course, like, you know, we have to work to immediately destroy that kind of worldview. But let me show you on the other side, another realm, why it should work well, why that's actually a good thing in some ways. You see, when circumstances are about to defeat you, you should look at those circumstances and say, what? Wait a minute. My dad is in charge of this world. My dad is in charge of this history. You cannot intimidate me, right? You see? You see what's going on here? At one level, it's pretty destructive. At the level of Sunday school, it's pretty destructive when a child says, hey, my dad's in charge. You, can tell me, you cannot tell me what to do. But at the universal level, on the spiritual level, it's very helpful and even powerful when you can say, hey, my father is a good, good father, and he's in charge of the whole freaking universe, right? Now, are you being defeated by your circumstances? Why? See, then you're not fixing your face on the fact that this is your father's world. Don't you see that holiness is so much more than just obeying the rules? It's a whole spirit. It's a whole set of characteristics that begin to spring up when you're holy and completely committed to God and you are focused on God. Lastly, what does it mean to be holy? The definition is also to be completely renovated by God, to be completely renovated by God. Here's what I mean. Look at verse 6 and verse 11. And throughout this prayer, have you noticed how often we are referred to by Jesus as his or yours to, to God the Father? Look at verse 6. He says, yours they will be. You gave them to me. In Exodus 19, verses 4, 5, and 6, it says this. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, God says to the people of Israel, you, say what I did in e- you saw what I did in Egypt and how I brought you in eagles' wings to myself, so you, would be my, so you would be my treasured possession, a holy nation, my own people. 
just so nobody thinks that that's the, that's the only true, that's only true of the Old Testament people of God. In the New Testament, Peter says to the church in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. What does it mean to be holy? It means this. Literally, in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a holy nation. You belong to God. You are God's people. Now, do you know what it literally says in 1 Peter 2, 9? It says that you are holy ethnic. That's what the word means, ethnic. Now, why would God say to Christians, you are holy, you are new and holy ethnic? Why does holiness turn you into a new ethnic? And here's why. Listen to this. What's the difference between an ethnic group and an organization? To be a member of the Boy Scouts or to be a member of the Rotary Club is not the same thing to be as a member of uh, of the Brazilian ethnic group or to be the Hungarian ethnic group or the Korean ethnic group. And here's why. An ethnic group is a culture. It's to be completely and totally comprehensive way of being. So if you are a Boy Scout, that means a couple of places in your life have changed, but not everything. You see, if you're African as opposed to Hispanic as opposed to Asian, a different culture is a whole different way of doing everything. Your ethnicity determines how men and women relate. Your ethnicity determines how you relate to people of other races. It determines economic relations, uh, relationships. It determines how the family works, how uh, children are raised, and what you think about good music. And it determines your attitude towards work and even your sense of humor. To be an ethnic uh, as opposed to that, uh, this ethnic as opposed to that ethnic is a total uh, comprehension of difference. And so what God is saying is pretty amazing here. He says, you come to me, if you are completely committed to me, and you are focused on me, it will change every area of your life, every area, every area. You'll say, what does it mean to be really be committed to you in the area of my work, in my humor, in my raising of my children, in my attitude towards uh, arts and movies and my attitude toward other people, about sports, toward other races and my business practices. It means that every area will be changed. Every single one of them will be affected by your ethnic uh, background in Christ. See, what, what, when the Bible says in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, it doesn't mean suddenly a Greek Christian is going to like Jewish Christian music, but here's what it means. It means this. It means a Greek Christian and a Jewish Christian will start to become so fundamentally changed in every area of their life as they commit completely to God and they are focused uh, completely on God that the Greek Christian will find that he or she has more in common with the Jewish Christian than with the Greek non-Christian. Bit by bit, we're going to find that we are so changed in every area of our lives that we will find that you are a Christian first before you are, an, you are an American. You are Christian first before anything else, before you are a uh, 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 laborer or management, before you are a member of this family or that family. You are Christian first. Do you know what, the, what it means to be Christian? Christian uh, dancers, uh, choreographers come together, and they have to say, what does it mean that the master, the king, my savior has touched me, and we are committed to him? How will this healing, how will his healing hands now be expressed in the way in which we do dance, right? In every area of our lives, it has to be changed. What does the Bible have to say about dance? How does the Lord wants, want us to dance? How shall we live in light, a light of these truths to express this change in the area of our work and activity? Fashion designers have to do the same thing. Business people have to get together and do the same thing. Mothers have to get together and do the same thing. Good night. Think about it. What does it mean to be a holy people? It means, first of all, there's not an area of my life that is not under the sovereignty of God. Abraham Kuyper says this, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine. There's not an area of your life that Jesus has not looked at and said, it's mine. You see? Christians begin to realize that they are being renovated in every single area. That means the church no longer can be thought of as a club, which is what most people think of, right? Rather, it's a place where a new humanity is being 
forged. Why do you think Paul is so upset in 1 Corinthians 6 when two Christians are having a dispute? They go to a judge and they sue one another in civil court. Why would Jesus be, or why would Paul be so upset about that? Why is he so angry about that? Because he says, you guys don't realize that you've just lost a ball game. Like I know of a pastor uh, up in Seattle who sued his own church. Oh, that is ridiculous. And Christians suing one another. That's ridiculous. You've lost the whole ball game. And Paul is upset because the whole point of being a holy people is that we as Christians have to have every part of our lives changed. And the way we deal with conflicts, the way we take criticisms, the way we handle the stress of work, the way in which we handle and respond to the effects of the coronavirus, our thoughts, our concerns with our health, our economy, and freedom, the world is supposed to be looking at us and saying, how in the heck do you do it? You are so different. You are so different from everybody in the way they're responding to all of this. Because we are forging a new humanity. We are a new creation. And as a new creation, we are not a people without hope. We are not a people without a Savior and a King who has promised to make all things new. We know that there's coming a day when all viruses will be no more. All pain and all suffering will cease. Everything broken will be fixed. Every pain will be healed. Everything lost will be found. That day may not be today, but that day is coming because of Jesus and his resurrection and the power of the gospel, the gospel which is the lifeblood of this new humanity called the people of God, who is holy, set apart, whose lives have been touched, every single part of our lives touched by God. In 1 Peter 2.9 it says, but you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How do you get the world to, to come and say, your God must be a great God? How do you get the world, your neighbors, your coworkers, people around you, how do you get them to say to, about you, your God must be a great God? By the holiness that you display, by the holiness of your life, the holiness of your practice. We are a new ethnic we are a new people. Before I'm a Korean or Asian American, I am a new ethnic. I'm a Christian. I'm a new people. We are forging a new humanity. The adventure of it all, the beauty of it all, that's what a church is. It's not a club. It's, it's a holy nation. You've been called to be a holy people to be his special treasure. I mean, think about this. He says, you are mine. I love that. Uh, think about this. Do you know what it means to be a holy nation, a holy people? It means that you belong to him. I know, I, I, I know a little boy uh, who has maybe a lot of expensive toys, but he only has one little raggedy doll, and for whatever reason, it's so special to him. He sings over that doll. He sleeps with that doll. He fights with any sibling who makes fun of that doll. It's mine. It's my special treasured possession. It's like Barnabas, my son, who has this um, a sleeping blanket. A, a, it's, a, it's like a, a blanket that he treasures ever since he, he was little. That's the thing that he tre treasures most, of all, uh, most above anything else he has, right? God has the audacity to say, you are mine. You are my treasured possession. In Malachi 3, it says, when God comes back to judge the world, he will collect his treasure, his jewels to himself. That's us. That's you and me. Imagine how that little boy looks at his treasured possession and lavishes himself on it and spares no expense for it. That's how God treats you. That's how God looks at you. The Lord, the God of the universe, has made you his special treasure. You are his holy people. You are his. How should you be treating yourself? Why would you give up on yourself? If the God of the universe is committed like that to us, imagine how he must be just ready, just ready to do incredible things in you and through you. Imagine what he must have in store for us. Imagine what it means for him to sing over us and to say, uh, I am for you, I, I love you, you are mine. And my dedication, my commitment is to make you holy. Now secondly, and more simply and shorter, there is the need for holiness. First, there is the, the definition of holiness. Now, lastly, the need for holiness. In other words, why should we be holy? 
When Jesus says in verse 19, for their sake I consecrate or I sanctify myself, it's all in that phrase, for their sake, for their sake. Uh, do you know, do you want to know how to be holy? You want to know how, how to grow and develop holiness in your life? Do you say, I love to be that committed. I love to be that focused. I would love to be that renovated, renewed, remodeled, and reconditioned. But it's so hard. I can't do that. I can't do that. Look, Jesus says, for their sake, do you know what this means, right? Do you know what that means? For their sake. For their sake. Jesus is saying, I've decided to put all of my resources, all that I have and am, aim is living in order to make them glorious, great. Jesus is in heaven today, not the way he was before he came to earth. And the reason why is because before he came to earth, he was his own person. Now he's completely sanctified. He's totally set apart. He is ruling everything, it says in Ephesians 1. So in Romans 8, everything he is, everything he is ruling in order to, to make you gloriously great and happy, to make you sanctified and to be consecrated. He came to earth. And do you know what he says in the garden? Father, they're going to die unless I pay the debt. Therefore, I separate myself from you so that they might be separated for you. I will be cut off. You can pour out your wrath upon me and I will be completely separated and cast out so that they can be brought in. I will be cut off so that these people can, people can be brought in. I'll be separated from you so that they might be separated for you. If you would just let those words, you know, I do all of these things for their sake. For their sake. If you would let those three words just lay on your heart for an hour, it will make you holy. This is all the power you need because let me tell you what it means to be holy. The dynamite, the energy, explosion, the transformation, the power, the catalyst, the change comes from looking at Jesus and saying, Lord and Savior, Master and King, Father and Shepherd, if you would sanctify yourself for me, for my sake, how can I not sanctify myself for you? If you would live completely for me so you're not even your own anymore, if you have given yourself utterly, completely, absolutely, even to the point of going to the cross and letting your life blood spill on, on the cross to die for me, how can I not, how can I not give myself utterly and completely for you? If you have consecrated and sanctified yourself, how can I do, not do the same? And that's all the power you need, I say, is all the hope you need, all the hope, because no matter what is in your way, you can look at it. Whatever it is that's in front of you, coronavirus, financial hardship, health worries, loss of a job, whatever that is, friends, whatever that is, and I know we're going through a tough situation. I know, like, it's alarming, it's concerning, it's, a lot of things have changed even from last Sunday. But whatever is in front of you, whatever that is, you can say, I'm not scared of you. I am not scared of you. Because the high king of heaven has sanctified himself just to make me gloriously great. He is completely committed to make me perfect, to get rid of all my distortions, all of my unholiness, and all of my unhappiness. He's going to make me a glorious, radiant creature without spot and blemish one day. Therefore, you can look at anything. You can look at the devil. You can look at the world, you can look at the virus, you can look at your enemies, you can look at death itself, and you can say, I have everything I need. You can take nothing from me of ultimate value. You have nothing I want. Don't you see? For their sake, I consecrate and sanctify myself. That's all the power you need. That's all the hope you need. That's why you should be holy. Look at what he has done for you, and you will be able to give yourself to him. Let's pray. Father, uh, I pray that this message would really hit home for us. Lord, we're in a time of crisis 
with this virus, Lord, and spreading and it's becoming more serious. But Lord, help us to be sanctified and holy even in the face of all that is happening around us. Lord, help us not to be afraid. Lord, you are all that we need. As we think about this, for our sake, you sanctified and consecrated yourself. Help us, Lord God, to be utterly, absolutely, completely be committed to you, to be focused on you, and to be renovated and to be remodeled by you, God. We thank you for the call to be holy and that your commitment to us is to make us holy, changing us little bit by little every single day. We thank you. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Father, I do want to pray um, for 
all my brothers and sisters and all my friends and people within the Bethel family and even from people outside of our Bethel family, but just who are just watching this. I pray for them right now. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in this crazy season that we're in, God. We don't know how long all of this is going to continue, Lord, um, but we do pray that uh, in the midst of all the craziness for God, that we would, Lord, keep our eyes on you, that, Lord, that we would just continually focus our eyes on you and upon the gospel. Lord, you're not surprised by anything that's happened. You are still sovereign and good and faithful. Lord, if we are afraid and we are concerned and if we are scared, it's okay. I think that's natural, Lord, but remind us, we've got to go to you. And may you give us and fill us with, with divine peace and even joy in the midst of struggle and difficulty. I do pray that my friends who are struggling, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work with them. And I pray that you, Lord, speak to us. And in through all seasons, that we would, Lord, grow in holiness. We would be set apart. It's really a perfect time as we go through the season of the coronavirus and affecting everything in life, Lord God, when the stocks are down and there's a, a lot of confusion, people losing jobs and fearful of finances and their health and, and just a lot of things happening. What a, what a perfect time for us to really uh, be set apart in the sense that we behave and act with our attitude and our, our word and deed different because we are holy people set apart. We are treasured possession. We belong to you, God. And may that empower us, Lord God. May we apply this word into our lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you everlasting peace. Amen. God bless you guys.